You have to use fear to push you to new heights. But when you reach the heights, when you face those fears in your life, you have to be able to turn off that fear of failure and say, you know what, I'm going to keep working. There may be failure later on down the road, but I already felt what failure felt like. So it can't be that much worse, so I have to keep pushing myself. Hey everybody, welcome to Impact Theory. You're here, my friends, because you believe that human potential is nearly limitless, but you know that having potential is not the same as actually doing something with it. So our goal with this show and company is to introduce you to the people and ideas that will help you actually execute on your dreams. All right, today's guest is one of the most accomplished and resilient human beings I have ever come across. Despite snapping his leg literally in half his freshman year in high school, he fought back becoming one of the best high school football players in the country, ultimately being offered a scholarship to play by more than 50 of the most prestigious college programs. Then, despite blowing out his knee his freshman year in college, breaking his leg again in his sophomore year, blowing out his back, tearing his rotator cuff, and even breaking his toe, many of them potentially career-ending injuries, he was still able to fight his way back to playing at an elite level, being named an All-American and the 2011 Big Ten Defensive Player of the Year, and shortly thereafter, he was also drafted 53rd overall in the 2012 NFL Draft. Finally, this poor guy's dreams had come true, but then, in his second year in the NFL, he dislocated his elbow, fought his way back from that, but then blew his back out again just two games later. After season-ending back surgery, he was almost killed from post-operative blood clots in his lungs, but as gnarly as all of that was, it was nothing compared to the fight he would find himself in just a couple of months later when his four-year-old daughter was diagnosed with stage four neuroblastoma, a rare form of pediatric cancer. But even that was not going to break this man or his daughter. He put his NFL career on hold and set about teaching her everything he knew about how to fight, and it worked. Despite being given only a 50% chance of living, she's now been cancer-free for years. Now retired, this truly anti-fragile man has dedicated himself to helping others as a speaker, high-performance coach, and the backbone of the Still Strong Foundation. The foundation has already raised millions of dollars to aid other families in the fight against pediatric cancer. So please, help me in welcoming the man who even the FBI has turned to for leadership training, former NFL star and future author of Still in the Game, Devin Still. Welcome, dude. Thank you. So good to have you on the show. It's a pleasure to be here. I was absolutely freaked out by your story. It is almost hysterical how many times you've been injured and told, oh, you're probably not going to play again. And right. then you just come back, come back, come back. How did you develop that mindset? Like, what was it that you went through that toughened you up? I think it would just have to be my upbringing. Um, Having that injury early on uh, in my high school career really helped out a lot because it, it tested my will. You know, I set out when I was young to want to be an NFL player or be a professional athlete. And sometimes when you, you say you want to be something, life tests just how much you want to be it. And for me, that happened when I was 14 and I broke my leg during basketball practice. Yeah, there's breaking your leg and then you said that your leg was hanging on by a tendon. Right. Just got to be pretty scary for anybody, let alone at that age. So how did you, and this is something I always find really fascinating about people that succeed at a high level, invariably at some point in their life, somebody in like authority, the person you're supposed to listen to, is going to say, yeah, this, you may not be able to come back from this. Mm -hmm. What was it that gave you the belief in yourself to say, I'm going to ignore that and I'm going to push through this? Right, because I saw other people do it before. You know, I'm not the first person who suffered a big injury during sports and if they were able to overcome that and still become that professional athlete then i felt as though i wasn't any different and the worst thing i can do was actually try and if it didn't happen then i would be okay with it but i couldn't settle with knowing that i never tried to see if i can overcome did you see other people either before college in college or in the nfl that that were broken by what they went through like whatever injury that they sustained just not be able to overcome it that happens a lot. You know, I wasn't the most talented person growing up in football. I actually was pretty terrible when I first started. But what stops people from making it to the highest level is that they don't overcome those injuries. They let the people come into their life and tell them, you know what, I don't think you're able to overcome this injury. And they don't even try. Whereas it's people who have the, the resolve to keep fighting and keep working towards a goal are the people who usually get their goals. You, there was actually an amazing quote that you said, um, 
and it was, I'm going to paraphrase it, but it was like, if you fail, don't worry, that doesn't make you a failure. It just means that what you were going after, you didn't want badly enough. Right. And I thought that was pretty interesting. How do, how do you find things that you want that badly? Like, how do you not fall prey to that? Where it's just like, well, I, I'm going to give up. I think people have to realize that they have to accept failure, but don't accept defeat. I think whenever you're trying to do something great, whenever you're trying to be successful, you're going to face failures, you know, but it's those lessons in the failures that really take you to greatness. If you look at sports, you know, when we go through practice, we fail all the time in practice, but they're controlled failures so that when it's really game time, when we step out on the field, when it really matters, we're able to execute because we failed so much in practice that we knew what we had to do in the game in order to succeed. And how do you think about failure? What, do you conceptualize it in a certain way that it's like a learning lesson or how do you keep it from damaging your ego? It hurts. Uh, don't get it. No, no doubt about it. Failure definitely hurts. Um, but the way that you're able to overcome those failures is say, you know what? I failed because of this reason. I'm going to take these lessons. I'm not going to focus on me failing, but I'm going to take the lessons and the failures so that when I move on and I try to do something new that I already have the equipment or the lessons in order to succeed the next time around. So one thing that I always, I like to ask guests, regardless of what I know about their kids, obviously I know a lot about Leah and the story of her going through the cancer. And one of the things that I found so interesting was that you couldn't fight the battle for her. She had to fight it herself, Mm -hmm. but you had made the decision that you were going to teach her how to fight. So one, how did you think about the, what you call the playbook? Like, how did you come up with the playbook? Um, and what were the lessons and what's it like teaching those to a kid? So I came up with the playbook because going into my third year at the NFL, I sat down with the reporter and he had asked me a lot of questions. But the one question that stuck out to me was he had asked me, you've been the top dog your whole career playing sports. What is it like to have to fight for your spot now in the NFL? And it kind of rubbed me the wrong way because I felt like he didn't understand what I went through in order to get to this point. So I started to go down a list of all the things that I went through in my life. And when I told him, he had this look of shock on his face. Like, man, I can't believe you were able to accomplish all this after going through all that. How was you able to do it? And that was the first time anybody had ever asked me that question. And I didn't have a good answer at that time. I just told him, I don't know. I just did. Fast forward a couple of months later, Leah got diagnosed with cancer and I was crushed. You know, I thought, When I heard the word cancer, I associated with death and I thought my daughter was going to die. But I decided to do some soul searching to find out what did I have in me that allowed me to overcome all the obstacles that I faced in order to make it to the NFL. And it was really football. You know, I've been playing football since I was 13 and it had been conditioning me my whole life without me knowing on how to overcome adversity, how to overcome obstacles. So I came up with a playbook that I was going to use to teach my daughter how to overcome the battle with cancer because the beautiful thing about the brain is that we're able to condition it to think whatever we wanted to think and do whatever we wanted to do. And I wanted to condition my daughter to think like an athlete so she can approach this battle with cancer like a game. So how does an athlete think? Well, first, I feel like you have to have a vision. You, you have to set big goals for yourself. I tell people all the time, we hear, you know, set obtainable goals that you can go after. But I honestly believe that you have to set big goals in life. And I compare it to the, the Olympics with the high jump. You know, when you watch the high jump, when they're warming up, these, these people, they set the bar pretty low for themselves, right? And if you see these jumpers jumping over the bar, they're barely getting over the bar, which is it's crazy to me. Because when I watch it, I'm like, you know, this guy's not going to go far. He can't even clear the low bar. But as the event goes on and they start to raise the bar higher and higher, that same jumper is clearing the bar with no problem. And that made me realize that You know, when you set the bar low for yourself, no matter how much potential you have, you only do enough to clear the bar. But if you set the bar high for yourself in life, you're going to do everything you can to get over that bar. And sometimes you're going to hit the bar. That's life. But if you set the bar high for yourself, you're still jumping higher than you would have if you set the bar low. So I wanted to set a big goal for my daughter, which was to beat cancer within a year. So what we did, when we set that big goal. And that was, if I remember right, they had told you it was going to take two years. So you literally cut that in half. It ain't. If it was successful, it would took two years. We didn't even know if she was going to be able to beat this disease. But I knew if we broke that that two year down in half, then we would work harder. What we did when we set that big goal was we broke it down into smaller goals. 
you know, so every time that she went in for chemo for five days, she would have a 21 day break in between. But we would celebrate after we got out of the hospital on no five days, like we just won the Super Bowl. Because <laughs> I felt like it was important for her to realize, you know, these are small steps that you're winning, but they're steps towards the bigger goal. So if you keep fighting, you keep building up these small victories, we're going to get the big victory in the long run. Yeah, that's, um, it, that's really important. There's a lot of studies that back that up. And one of the things that I found most fascinating to your point about having really big goals is that the person who says, oh, I want to lose five pounds, right? They, their rate of failure is astronomical. And it's like 10 times worse than somebody who says, I'm going to go from morbidly obese to having six pack abs. Right. And you would think, how is that possible? But it's because people get excited. It's something that gets you amped up, which gives you that energy to keep pushing. Mm -hmm. Going back to your earlier quote about um, if you fail, don't worry, it doesn't make you a failure. You just, you just weren't excited enough about right. the thing that yeah. you were chasing. Now, how did you in all of this, other than it's been well documented how playful you were with Leah through the whole process, dancing and celebrating like you guys have won the Super Bowl. How did you keep her focused and excited on what you guys were trying to accomplish? I think when you're trying to lead a movement, you have to get the person to believe in it just as much as you do or else it doesn't work. You know, so what I did with Leah is I made sure that she pictured herself being a cancer survivor before she actually was. And, you know, the interesting thing is I went to um, San Quentin prison a couple of weeks ago where I, I visited with some of the inmates. And one of the inmates had asked me, you know, how do you hold on to hope in, during dark times? Because he had been locked up since he was 18 and he got 54 years to life. And I was telling him that if you ever wanted to leave the prison, you first had to let your mind leave it first. Like you may be trapped here physically, but once you get your mind out of it, you'll start to act a certain way. You'll start to do the things you need to do in order to get out of here. So what I did with Leah is I made sure that she saw that she was a cancer survivor. I made her wear the shirts. I told her stories about people who beat the disease. And I said, you know, they're no different than you. If you take this same approach, if you start to act like you're a cancer survivor now, then you'll do the things that, you know, cancer survivors does. You'll be able to fight through the pain that you had to fight through in order to get to your goal. And when I was able to get her to see how important it was to start acting like it before she actually was, then it was easy. It was easy. That, that's incredible. It's doubly incredible given that she was four years old as you're going through this process. Um, so I know we haven't gotten through all the things in your playbook, but really fast, tell us the story and where does it fit into the playbook of the crayons, which you're a better man than I, dude. That's like, honestly, I don't know that I could do that, but it was so impressive. Right. That, that, was, that was a tough moment, but I think it was a pivotal moment for Leah's battle with cancer. And it's actually when she... She got rolled into the, the room after having a seven and a half hour surgery to remove her tumor. When they rolled her in there, I, I didn't even know it was my daughter. Like she was really swollen. She was lethargic. She wasn't, she couldn't move. She couldn't talk. It was scary. Um, but they had told us that it was important for her to be able to move as days go on. And I remember it was probably a day after her surgery or two days after her surgery. And at the end of her bed, there was a, a table with a coloring book and crayons. And she had just started opening her eyes and talking and she had asked me if I could pass her the crayons so that she can color. And you know, I jumped right up and told her, yeah, I'll get the crayons for you. But when I went to reach for the crayons, something stopped me. It was like, you can't do this. You're taking away from her moment. Like this is the beginning of her fight with cancer. And she has to realize that she's strong enough to overcome whatever she's going through. So I sat back on the, the couch in the hospital room and I told her, you know, I could get these crayons for you, but you have to get them yourself. You have to prove to yourself that you're, you're capable of overcoming the pain that you're going through right now. And she gave me this crazy look like she was just she was mad at me. Like, you didn't know I just went through a seven hour surgery, but I didn't care because I knew this was her moment. So she started to sit up in the bed and she reached out for the, the crayons. She failed and she fell back onto her pillow and you can see just the look of disappointment in her face, you know? And at that moment, I kept questioning myself, is this the right time to push her? Like, just get the crayons for her, we'll try it another day, we'll try it tomorrow. But as you know, tomorrow is the worst word in the, in the book, in the world, because tomorrow can never come, it can always go to the next day. So I said, no, we're gonna do this right now. 
And I told her, come on, you can do this. Just try it again. Just try harder than you did the first time. And I promise you, you're going to get it. So she sits up and she starts reaching for the crayons again. And we're probably at the two, three minute mark now, her just trying to reach for the crayon. And she finally just jumps forward, grabs it and falls back onto her pillow. And the look on her face of just excitement and overcoming and knowing that she was strong enough, I, I think was just the mentality that she took through the rest of her fight, knowing that, you know, I may be in pain right now, but I'm strong enough to overcome this. Mm, I love that. So I, I don't know how many plays the playbook has. I know of four of them, mm-hmm. um, which are, I think, really amazing. So one we've already talked about, which is setting the goals. And then um, number two, at least, as you described it in one of the talks that I watched was purpose. Mm-hmm. Um, how do you find your purpose? How do you make sure that it's something intense enough that's going to see you through the difficulties and the failures? Um, I think when you when you go out and you set a purpose for something, it has to be bigger than yourself. It can't always be about money or the, the monetary things because I've been able to reach those things and it didn't bring me the happiness or the satisfaction that I thought. You know, I was driving down the street a, a couple of weeks ago and I was in San Francisco. In San Francisco, there's a lot of mountains, right? And I saw this really big mountain from its base, but I couldn't see the top of the mountain because, you know, it was covered with fog. and to me, it really represented life. You know, a lot of the times we we set goals for ourselves. We climb, we want to climb these big mountains, but if we can't see what's at the top of the mountains, we're reluctant to go after it. You know, and a lot of times we're stuck standing at the base waiting for that weather to pass so that we can see how far we have to climb and see what is exactly is at the top of the mountain. But I think people who have a bigger purpose, they climb that mountain regardless if they can see the top because they realize that it's not really what's at the top of the mountain that's important, but it's the lessons along the journey. Because whether you get what you wanted at the top of the mountain or you don't get, I think you're left with the same question, which is what now? If you look at your situation, you was at the top of the mountain, you built this billion dollar company, but still when you got to the top of the mountain, you asked yourself, okay, what next? What's next? Because I think happiness only comes from progress. So if you stay at the top of the mountain too long, you no longer are happy. So what you did is you took the lessons that you learned from climbing that mountain to climb a new mountain, to build this type of company. So I think it's important for people to understand is it's really the lessons along the journey that's the real big prize. Because when you go climb the new mountain, you now have an understanding of what equipment you need to climb that mountain, what lessons you need in order to climb that mountain, because the next mountain you climb is easier because you already been through the hard part, which is just initially trying. But when you're doing it for a bigger purpose than just yourself, it's harder to give up because, you know, people are dependent on you. And that's how it was when I was going through with my injuries with football. You know, I had a lot of instances during my freshman year in college where I realized that it would be selfish of me to give up because it was times I wanted to give up. It was hard, like suffering two major injuries, two season in the surgeries, back to back years. You have a you question yourself a lot. Is it worth it? Is it worth fighting through? But I realized that I had a a way to provide a better lifestyle for my family. You know, I grew up in a type of city where all it is is drugs and violence. And actually going into my freshman year, I went home to go to a party with some of my friends. And at that party, I watched somebody get killed right in front of my face. And I told myself that no matter what I went through in college, that I was going to keep fighting because I didn't want my family. I didn't want to have to raise my kids in that same environment that I was raised in. So when I faced adversity and I wanted to give up, I realized that if I give up, I'm letting a lot of other people down and I couldn't do that. Yeah, man, I get that for sure. What is your purpose now? Uh, You know, it took for me to watch my daughter battle cancer to find out what my purpose was, because I always wanted to be in the NFL, make a name for myself in the NFL. But then my daughter's fight with cancer really brought a lot of perspective to my life and and what's important. So I I tell people all the time, I may not be playing football anymore, but I'm still in the game. And it's, it's my game, my game of life. I don't know what quarter I'm in right now, but as I tell everybody, you know, as an athlete, I'm conditioned to fight for four quarters. So what I want to do with my life now is just empower people take the lessons that I learned from my pain and my obstacles to help people overcome their pain. Because as a competitor, I was taking so many losses, you know, 
And when you're an athlete, when you're a competitor, you like to win. And the way I looked at life is if I'm able to take these lessons and help people change their life, then I'm going to win overall. Because the more obstacles I face, the more lessons I learn, the more content I have in order to share with people. So I'm just looking to win the game of life. So I had written an intro for you that was more focused on the like just the accomplishments, all American, you know, 53rd overall, like going through all of those. And then I heard you say that. And I was so I was stopped in my fucking tracks when you said that not only did you not resent the things that you'd gone through, but that they were giving you the tools that you needed to go and help other people. And I was like, Jesus, like so many people have such a hard time reframing their life in general. The smallest thing will stop them. But to be able to reframe the story that you've had, it's literally this unrelenting like list of problems, obstacles, things you've had to overcome. Uh, and in all of that, you get to one of your plays, which is have fun. Mm. And I thought, wow, like to be learning from what you're going through and to have like one of your marquee takeaways from everything you've been through to have fun. Why is that so powerful? That's a lesson I learned playing football. You know, as you get to different levels of, of sports, you really start to see the fun get taken away from it because it starts to turn into a business. Remember when I was young, my little league coach always told us that you have to have fun because once you take away the fun, you already lost because you, you're not doing it for what you started out doing it for. And it was interesting because when Leah first got diagnosed with cancer, you know, I stayed in the hospital all the time with her. I never left the hospital for a straight month when she first got diagnosed. But one night I decided to go to my wife's house just because I needed to get my mind right and just get myself out of that type of environment for a little bit. And while I was there, you know, her roommate had a group of friends over and they was talking, they was having fun. And somebody told a joke and the whole room burst out in laughter. And I started laughing and it was crazy because in an instance, my brain told me to stop laughing and I stopped and I just sat there on the couch thinking to myself, like, what was so funny? Like my four year old daughter was in the hospital battling death. There's absolutely nothing that should be funny. But as I started to sit there and I was thinking more, I'm like, I can't take this approach because if I have this mindset going into Leah's battle with cancer, we're always just so somber. We're always asking the question, why us? Why do we have to go through this? then we're gonna lose. But if we learn to control our own emotions and not tie it to certain events, but have complete control of our settings, then you know we, we can overcome this disease. And I'm telling you, I feel like because of we, I was able to shift my mindset in that moment, that allowed us to overcome because we had joy, we had happiness. It didn't matter what the doctors were telling us. It didn't matter what she was going through. It didn't matter the stress that I was going through being away from her. We just tried to have fun as much as we could. Dude, that's really incredible. And I can only imagine having to face down something like that. And what I love about this is there's always this sense when you tell your story of learning lessons in real time that have real practical use that you learn and then you apply, um, which I think is, is really, really incredible. And you once said that we all have moments of weakness mm. and, um, but they're just that, they're moments. And I don't let my moments of weakness turn into a mindset. Mm -hmm. How important is mindset? Like what are elements that make up like a, the kind of powerful mindset that you have that you've passed on to your daughter? Where I see a lot of people go wrong is they think those showing signs of weakness is weak, but I think it's necessary. Cause sometimes you have to cry, you have to get it all out so that you're able to make decisions that are not based off emotions. You know, a lot of times when people saw me on TV talking about my daughter, I was crying a lot because I was trying to deal with these emotions that I was facing with. When I was behind closed doors and I was just with my wife at the house, I was crying a lot. I was trying to find something inside me to keep fighting for my daughter, to keep, keep moving. And I didn't let those, those moments where I felt weak consume me and turn into a mindset. I let them be just that, I let them be moments. And when I got done crying, I wiped the tears off, got up and was like, okay, this is what we need to do next to keep fighting. And I think that's, that's a key that people need to realize that it's okay to be weak, but when you 
you're able to show these signs of weakness, then people are able to step in and help you. And you can't get through things alone that you, you need to help. And in order to do that, you have to show that you're weak. It's really interesting. Uh, I have multiple questions in here. So one, do you have things that you're telling yourself in those moments of weakness that will get you quickly out of it? Or, and if so, what are those things? It's not something I tell myself, it's something I picture. Um, goals are intangible. They always start out as intangible. You first have to see it in your mind first in order for it to become true. And it's, it's interesting because when I'm traveling a lot, people always ask me the same question is, how does it feel to play in the NFL, right? And I always respond and say, it feels exactly how you think it would feel if you reached your goals. And I would see the person's face just light up because they were able in that moment to picture what it would feel like if they accomplished their goals. So that's what I always would tell myself. What would it feel like if Leah beat cancer? What would it feel like if you made it to the NFL? Because what I did was take that feeling and compare it to the pain I was facing at the time. And if that feeling of overcoming the obstacles I was facing was greater than the pain, then I kept pushing. You know, I wanted to use my pain in order to get me to greatness, but I first had to feel and see what it would be like if I overcame these obstacles and achieved my goals. That's really powerful in terms of being a pretty simple math equation of being able to look at, okay, this is what I think this would feel like and that's a certain kind of rad. And then there's what I'm going through or gonna have to go through in order to get there. Yeah. Have there been times where you're like, ah, the math equation doesn't add up and so now I'm gonna stop? Yeah, it happened with me retiring. Um, it's hard. I, I tell everybody that you have to learn when to call audibles in your life. You have to learn when to make pivots. A lot of people get confused and think that, you know, if they keep fighting, then that's, that's strength. That's true strength. But sometimes true strength is being able to see what life is giving you and making a pivot in your life to do something different. And I had put 13 years into football of literally blood, sweat and tears. And to walk away from it was the hardest thing I had to do. But I felt like I, I had a bigger purpose. And I realized that what I could, could achieve on the football field wasn't worth the pain that I, I was going through. You know, because I, I had foot surgery a couple of years ago after uh, playing against the Titans. And although I could make it back, because I proved that when I, I made it back with the Jets, the long-term pain that I would go through with, you know, the arthritis and stuff that I would face in my foot and what my family would have had to go through it wasn't worth it to me. You know, I felt like it was time to walk away and do something I felt like my true purpose was at. And when I thought about it, of course, starting over is hard. You know, the unknown is, is always hard. That's why people don't like to do new things because you don't know what it's gonna lead towards. But I was willing to take the chance because when I feel the feeling that I would get from being able to change people's mindset, I'm able to build this big company that just empowers people is greater than the pain of walking away from a sport that I love. Mm, that makes a lot of sense. You mentioned earlier playing through four quarters, all through all four quarters. Um, what did you tell Leah about that? Because I know her first round of experimental treatment didn't work. Mm -hmm. And so that had to be a wildly disheartening moment for you guys. And when it's a wildly disheartening moment for adults and it's crushing, I can only imagine what it's like when you're a four year old and are going through that. So what did you tell her? What is that whole concept? Yeah, so when she first got diagnosed, we, we put her into a, a new clinical trial um, that they had made specifically for her type of cancer, which was neuroblastoma. And after the first four months of treatment, it was hard, but I was able to motivate my daughter to keep her pushing because let her know that when we get these results back, that things might change for us. So when we got the results back after her first treatment, and we found out that the cancer had went from her hip to her chest, to her arms, to her skull, to her shoulders. She was disappointed. I felt like she thought that she was letting me down because she was, she promised me in the beginning that she was going to give it everything she has and that she was going to overcome cancer. But that moment was hard for her. Right. So we had put her into a new trial. Um, and this trial, it was tough. Like I saw it really wearing my daughter down. Like it was, it was literally beating her up. And it was one time in the hospital that things got really bad. And she hadn't talked to me in two days. She didn't eat nothing. She was just, she was just there. 
You know, if it wasn't for the monitors, I would have thought that my daughter was gone. But the monitor showed that her heart was still beating. But I went over to her bed and I just whispered in her ear and I told her, you know, I know you're going through a lot of pain right now. But this pain is only temporary. And you promised me when we first started this fight that you was going to fight for four quarters. And I need you to keep that promise. I need you to fight through the pain that you're going through right now because we don't know if this can be the treatment that saves your life. And she had whispered to me and she said, okay, dad. I felt like in that moment that I knew my daughter wasn't going to give up. And a couple of months later, we went back in to get the results from her new treatment. And the doctors told us it was going to be about three to four days before we got the results. So we left the hospital. And as we were driving home, my phone started ringing. And I picked it up and it was the doctor. And she said, Mr. Still, I know that I told you it was going to take three to four days, but this couldn't wait. And my heart dropped because I thought it was going to be something bad. Like There's no reason for you to rush and call me when you just told me it was going to take three to four days. But she told me, you know, we just looked at the scans and there's no evidence of disease. It's She's in remission. Wow. And I just dropped the phone and I just started smiling. And I looked to my left at my wife and I looked in the back seat at my daughter and they both had big smiles on their face. And my daughter said, Dad, did I beat up cancer? And I told her, yes. And at that moment, I can't even explain the feeling. It was like knowing that my daughter was born again. The feeling that I had when she was first born, it was multiplied by a thousand because it was like I was watching a rebirth. She had a second chance at life. And in that moment, I realized how important it is to fight for four quarters because you never know what you what can happen if there's still time on the clock. It's incredible, man. So when you're fighting for four quarters and it's brutally difficult and it's really painful, what tactics do you have for dealing with that pain? Whether the pain is physical, which I imagine you've gone through in just catastrophic amounts in rehabbing and things like that, or mental. Like what are the the tactics that you have? Um, yeah, like you said, I've been through some crazy injuries. <laughs> I mean, painful. I mean, painful. The rehab process is gruesome. But like I said earlier, people try to make it seem like having this type of mindset is just it's so hard that you have to have all these different things in in your backpack to use when you need it. But it's it's really simple. And it's really just picturing what you want out of life, being able to visualize what exactly do you want and being able to hone that feeling that you would get from not giving up the feeling that your family would get from experiencing a life because they knew you didn't give up and if that's greater than the pain which most of the time is going to be then you got to keep fighting because it's painful success is painful you know what i mean you have to go through a lot of ups and downs but when you get that up that last up it's it's a beautiful thing have you ever had anybody say to you okay i get it but i don't know what i want Mm -hmm. what do you say to them if you don't know what you want i can't tell you You know what I mean? You have to do some soul searching yourself to find out what you really want because a lot of people, they go through life without having goals. They're just here. And I honestly believe that everybody's here for a purpose, but you have to find out what that purpose is. So do you think there's a process that people can go through? And and I push on this one because I get asked this a lot. It's probably the the question I get asked the most is, I don't have a passion. How do I find my passion? I don't think anybody finds their passion. I think that you develop a passion. I think you create it. Um, Much like you created your passion for football. And I'm guessing you didn't touch on it too much. um, But I'm guessing that a a big part of it was looking around um, where you were growing up and saying, there's only so many escape routes for me. Mm -hmm. And I know that you were the first person to graduate college in your family. So that becomes a potential like path out. But the only way that I'm gonna have enough energy to actually see this all through is to fall in love. And I find that even that is a a process of fanning the flames. And the first time somebody tells you, whoa, you're really good at that. You think, oh, wow, that felt good. I want that feeling more. So you fan those flames. Um, and then you can develop it into a fascination, which then through the gaining of mastery, and now I'm just stealing from a book called So Good They Can't Ignore You, um, through the process of gaining mastery, it actually turns into a passion. Mm-hmm. Do you think that there's a similar kind of process to help people find a purpose? Or do you think, judging by what you just said, that it's sort of merely giving a story to it like you did with your daughter that helps bring that purpose? 
Yeah, I think it's all about perspective. At the end of the day, that might not have been the, the reason why my daughter had cancer, but because we tied that story with that situation, it gave us a purpose. And I think what people have to do is, they really have to do some soul searching and find out what do they like doing in life. All right, I want to talk about your shirt for a second. So one, you have a lot of cool shirts, which we will definitely make sure that we link to your website and stuff because some of these are really dope. Um, what, what does this one mean? Fear and excuses are both off. I made this shirt um, because I needed to remind myself that I was in control of my own settings. And no matter what I, I go through in my life, that if I wake up, I have the, the chance and I have control of how I attack that day. So the biggest things to me were uh, excuses, determination and fear. Because the things I went through in my life, I could have made a bunch of excuses for why I didn't make it to the NFL, or why I didn't I become a Penn State All-American. But I knew if I used those excuses in that instance, I would use that for the rest of my life and everything that I don't accomplish. So I felt as though I needed to turn my excuses off in my life so that I could accomplish the things that I want. And determination, I think everybody has to have that because you find out when you're trying to become successful, when you're trying to do something great, if you don't have determination, if you don't have the mindset that you're never gonna give up, it's gonna be easy to give up because there's a lot of ups and downs that you have to go through along the journey. And fear is just something that I think holds people back. Um, like I told you the story about the mountains, people have fear of climbing that mountain, not knowing what's at the top of the mountain. But people who are fearless are gonna go out there and do things, even if they don't know what the outcome is, just because they know it's gonna hold them back from achieving great things. So these are the three things I wanted to put on my shirt to remind me, as long as I have control of these three settings and I can go out there and do whatever I wanna do with my life. And do you think it's being fearless or do you think that it's overcoming fear? I think it's a little bit of both. I think that you need fear. In some instances, you don't need fear. Sometimes fear motivates people to keep pushing themselves. Some people are scared of failure. So they want to keep pushing themselves to make sure that they don't fail. But along the journey, you're going to eventually fail sometimes. So you have to have, you have to turn the fear off in a sense of failing. You have to use fear to push you to new heights. But when you reach the heights, when you face those fears in your life, you have to be able to turn off that fear of failing and say, you know what, I'm going to keep working. There may be failure later on down the road, but I already felt what failure felt like. So it can't be that much worse. So I have to keep pushing myself. You've got a couple of other shirts. What are some of your favorites? The know your worth. What does I that think mean? It's very important for people to know their worth before they go out into this world because it's a scary place. And when you don't know what, you, what you're worth, somebody or something will tell you. You know, a lot of times when I was growing up and I was facing these type of injuries, people were telling me, you can't come back from this. But I already believed that I could because I seen other people do it. I know what I'm capable of doing. So it doesn't matter what you tell me. I know what I'm worth. You know, and if people go out here and, you know, some teachers tell people they're not smart enough to go to college. You're not pretty enough to do this. You're not you know, capable of doing that. But if you already believe in yourself that you're able to accomplish whatever you set out to do, then I feel like you can accomplish anything because you know your worth. I'm glad you brought that up. You talked about um, people that negativity, A, is, is going to happen, and then B, that you can actually use it to propel you forward. How do you think about negativity? And I'm sure you've had a lot more than just somebody thinking, oh, no, no, you're not going to be able to come back from this leg that actively, like, you're never going to succeed. People from Wilmington, Delaware, they don't go on to become athletes. Like, how do you use that? I think the biggest example of that is my junior year in college. And I had just overcame these two serious injuries with the ACL, MCL, and then breaking my fibula. And I would go on the internet because it was big blog sites for Penn State football. And I saw people on there always saying, oh, Devin still sucks. We don't know why we got him, why he came to this school. And it hurt. But I used that hurt to push me my senior year. And you said, say, you know what? When it's all said and done, I'm going to prove these people wrong. That I'm going to show them that I'm, I'm here for a reason and that these injuries are not going to stop me from doing what I first came here to do. So every day I would post those negative blog posts on my wall 
right? And every time I would wake up, I would read those. When I was waking up at four o'clock in the morning to go work out, when I was staying in the gym later than everybody else, I visualized these blog posts where people were telling me that I wasn't going to make it to the NFL and I wasn't going to be good enough. And I used that as fuel to keep pushing myself to do the things that I didn't necessarily want to do, but I knew I had to do it in order to get the goals that I wanted. I absolutely love that. Do you think at all about having a chip on your shoulder and it being useful? I think you do. You, you need a chip on your fo- shoulder in order to push yourself when you want to give up. Because there's a lot, there's going to be a lot of people that doubt you, but you have to go out there and not only prove those doubters wrong, but prove yourself right. Because a lot of people, when you get bullied or when people tell you you can't do something, they picture themselves in, they picture themselves in your situation. And they tell themselves, man, if I was going through that, there's no way I would be able to overcome that or reach my goal. So I know they can't do it. But you have to prove to them that you can overcome. And that not will only turn them into supporters, but it will also inspire them that whatever they're going through in their life, they can overcome it as well because they just saw what you went through. All right. Now I need your help. You mentioned bullies. So now I want to go down this path. So I was doing an AMA Live where I talked to the camera. You can ask me anything you want about anything. And this guy wrote in and said, um, I have a much younger brother and he's, he's overweight and he's getting bullied and it's really starting to be a problem for him. And I don't know what to do. And I said, you know what? Give me on a, a, I gave like a whole spiel about here's what I think you need to do. And I felt like it was awesome advice on paper, but I didn't know if it would work in real life. Mm. And so after giving the advice, which was more or less like, at the end of the day, I don't want this to be true, but motherfucker has to toughen up. Mm. So just know, uh, right? I'm not saying that that's a good thing or a bad thing. I'm just saying he's going to have to get tougher mentally. He's got to decide whether he's okay with his weight or not. Because if he is, then fuck everybody that tells me he's got a problem. And if he's not, then he's got to make a change. Mm. Like that's, that's the truth. And then I said, <laughs> feeling good about the advice I'd given on camera, I said, put me on the phone with this kid. Mm-hmm. And A, I want him to know somebody else cares, right? So if his brother looks up to me, then potentially I'll have some juice on the call. So let's do a Skype call, get me on the phone with him. And we got on the phone together and I was completely ineffective. Mm. And I realized I don't know how to translate this to kids. So as, because literally every tool that I have assumes that your brain is developed Mm -hmm. and that I can hit you with that, that I can reason with you, that I can point out conflicting moments in your own arguments like, Um, I don't care about my weight at all. And yet I cry myself to sleep, right? Then it becomes very easy to say, Hey, look, you don't need to care about your weight, but don't lie to yourself if you secretly do Mm. right now. That's easy with an adult that's hard as hell with a kid, but you've gone through this with a four year old. I don't understand. So like, what would you say to a kid? Let's say he's 10, 11 years old. He's being bullied and he's being bullied about his weight, Mm -hmm. right? So it is something very real and he's very sensitive about it. Let's touch on what you said. You have to be honest with yourself. You know, when you're at 10, 11, your brain is more developed than, you know, me dealing with my four year old old daughter. But you have to be real f- to yourself. And a lot of people say you have to look yourself in the mirror and be honest. But I, I think you can't look in the mirror. You, and when you look in the mirror, you have to see the person that you, you don't want to see. I think that's what stops people from being successful. Is we look in our mirror and we say, you know what, I'm not I don't care about my weight. I'm comfortable with my weight. But deep down inside, we're not. So you have to look yourself in the mirror and tell yourself, you know what? I'm not comfortable with the way I am. And this all goes back to knowing your worth. If you don't like your worth, then you have to find ways to add value to yourself. You have to go back to school. You have to go to the gym. You have to do things that make you feel good about yourself because no matter if you chose to lose the weight for them, so you stop getting bullied. If that's not something you really wanted to do, then you're going to have to deal with that later on mentally. Yeah. I love that. Um, you exude the qualities of what I would say are a good leader. It's not a surprise to me at all that the FBI brought you in for leadership training. And it's also not a surprise to me that you were the team captain. But what people may not realize is that you were the team captain through the school's worst scandal. Mm -hmm. What was it like? What was it like to watch your coaches and everybody who's supposed to have it all together start to crack and fall apart? How did you step into that leadership position and and what does it mean to be a leader? The interesting thing about it, I never looked at myself as being a leader when I was growing up. I thought that you always had to be born 
with those leadership qualities. But what I realized is that the leaders didn't always start in front of the line, that a lot of them started off in the back, but they had the courage to step out of the line and go up to the front. And I decided to do that my junior year with, at the bowl game. Um, I knew that our seniors were graduating, our, our leaders were graduating, and I wanted to take on that leadership role. And I let that be known going into the bowl game. And then the, my senior year, I got elected to be a captain. But I didn't know what being a captain was all about at that point in time. I thought it was all fun. And when the news broke, I was sitting in my, my house. And across my screen, I saw Joe Paterno is fired. And I looked on the screen and they showed the campus breaking out in what they called riots. And I told myself I couldn't let Penn State be known for this. That, that's not what the Penn State community is all about. So the next day I called a, a squad meeting um, with the team and I told them when we go out for this game for our senior night this weekend that we're not going to run out the tunnel as individuals, but we're going to lock arms and show everybody that if we stick together that we can overcome this adversity. And I think that was a pivotal moment for Penn State as a whole because it showed people that we wasn't going to fall apart, no matter what people thought about us on the outside, that we knew we were strong enough to overcome. When I you know, took that role as the captain, then I was basically telling the players, I was telling the Penn State community that I'm going to do whatever's in the best interest of the university and not what's in the best interest of Devin. You've talked about in the notion of integrity that it has to do also with hidden ifs. Mm -hmm. What are the hidden ifs and how do they stop people from living up to their integrity? All right, so what I mean by hidden ifs is, you know, when we go through life, sometimes we will set a goal for ourselves, and without knowing we'll tie hidden ifs to it. Like if I say I wanted to make it to the NFL, if I get a scholarship or if I don't go through any injuries. And I think if we want to make progress as a society, we have to learn to start taking away those hidden ifs because there was a time period where you know, if you shook somebody's hands and you looked them in the eye, you said you was going to do something, you did it no matter what. But nowadays we have all these different contracts that have words in it that we don't even understand just to protect ourselves from people if they don't follow through. So I feel like in life, when you tell yourself you're going to do something, you can't base it off of what opportunities that you're given. What is next for you? What are you doing? How do you make sure that your future is bigger than your past, which was pretty massive? Yeah. So. It's basically letting go of the last play. I think whether you accomplish a lot in your life or you don't accomplish a lot, I think the people who are at the top of the game in business and life and in, in sports is people who forget about the past and let go of the last play. So right now I'm focusing on not thinking about all the things that I accomplished in my past, but focusing on right now and how I can be successful in this moment. And what I want to do is just bring the mindset that we have of athletes to the business world, to people's lives, and let them know that you don't have to be an athlete in order to think like an athlete, that it's, it's all a mindset that you need to have. And once you have this mindset, you're able to compete at the highest level of life, no matter what you're trying to do. So just empowering people and letting them know that whatever your dreams are, then you're capable of reaching it. I love that. All right, before I ask my last question, where can these guys find you online? Right, I'm on Still in the Game on YouTube, on Instagram, and my website is DevinStillInTheGame.com. Nice. All right, my final question. What's the impact that you want to have on the world? It's a tough one. Um, I actually, I went to a funeral not too long ago of a, a family member. And when I was sitting in the crowd, you know, the pastor was talking and he said, what do you want your tombstone to read when it's all said and done? And that made me reflect a lot in that moment is that I've been chasing so long for my tombstone to be, you know, he was this great NFL player. He was a great football player, but I feel like I'm destined for so, so much in life, greater things than just, you know, playing a sport that right now I'm playing the game of life and I'm trying to help other people win the game of life. So what I, when it's all said and done, I actually, I don't even want a tombstone to, to remind people that I've been here. I want to leave an impact in the cancer community, in the business world, in people's lives that when I'm gone, that the values and the lessons that I taught people live long, way, way longer than I did. 
Love that, man. Well, thank you so much for being on the show. It's incredible. All right, guys, this, this truly is one of the most incredible examples of mindset that I've ever seen in my life. Go back and listen to all the things that he had to overcome. I literally couldn't give each one their due because listing them out made this intro about twice as long as my normal intro. But that's how many problems he went through and had to overcome. And every time he fights back, and he doesn't just fight back to playing, he fights back to playing at an elite level. It's literally absurd how one injury after another, he comes back, he comes back, he comes back. And then when finally it seems like, okay, all the injuries are behind him, that's when then it gets passed on to his daughter and he has to go through that incredible ordeal. And somehow on the other side of that, not only does he return to football, but he finds something bigger than that beyond football so that he can really create the next amazing chapter in his life. And through all of it, he doesn't make excuses. He doesn't give in to fear. He understands that his life is in his control. It's something that he has to create, that he has to stand up, that he has to paste the people writing about him, that he sucks, that he never should have been there, whoever that hater is at that moment in his life, to be willing to stare at that, to leverage that, to fight through, to believe in what he's doing enough that no matter how much pain he has to suffer through, that he's gonna keep going to be a man who has integrity, to be a man of his word, to be a man that needs only shake your hand and tell you that he's going to do it and then execute against it. And we all get to see that that's exactly what he's done with his life. It's absolutely incredible. He's lived it in the spotlight and I will make a prediction right now. What this man is about to do with his life will dwarf everything that he's done up to this point. Right now, as of the recording of this show, he is very difficult to find on certain parts of the internet. I'll say YouTube specifically. Go watch his content. It is, I have the chills. It is breathtaking. It is powerful. He is one of the most effective speakers I've ever seen in my life. And that's him at the beginning of his career. Five years from now, I think he's gonna be a dominant force. You hear, heard it here first. All right, if you guys haven't already, be sure to subscribe. And until next time, my friends, be legendary. Take care. Yeah. My friends, thank you so much. Hey everybody, thank you so much for watching and being a part of this community. If you haven't already, be sure to subscribe. You're gonna get weekly videos on building a growth mindset, cultivating grit, and unlocking your full potential.